everybody. Uh, my name is Sergey. Uh, I'll tell a few words about myself. Uh, I'm uh, the uh, CTO of a small uh, startup company here in Dublin called Sesanta. Uh, and step what we do. One, two, three, yeah. four. Is it okay? Yes, yeah, Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, did, you s did, did you hear what I've said already? Uh, All right. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Sergey. I'm the CTO of the tech startup called Sesanta. We are Dublin based. Um, and what we do, we do a full stack platform for the Internet of Things. So prior to Tessanta, I've, I've worked at Google as an engineer for six years, and I've been a CTO of another Irish startup from West Coast. We were doing a network security equipment. So uh, first, before proceeding, I'd like to know, uh, please raise your hands who know what IoT is. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and please raise your hands who's an embedded engineer. Cool. Okay, cool, nobody, uh, that's awesome. Um, so uh, that's the reason why I'm talking to you guys, because uh, uh, we, are, we are an embedded engineers ourselves. So and we are making a JavaScript enabled uh, firmware for small devices. So since you know what IoT is, I don't need to explain. So um, this is a quick agenda, quick, uh, a quick plan of my talk, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about, about JavaScript. You, you know already all that stuff, so I'll repeat maybe what you already know. Uh, I'll talk about the engines, about how and why JavaScript is embedded in, in other programs, and I'm going to showcase a, our, our software on the, uh, one of the uh, hardware platforms that we support. Uh, and then, uh, as the last thing, I'm going to talk about a V7, which is the code name of our JavaScript engine, and a few tricks that makes it so small. So, uh, first of all, quick history about JavaScript. It was created at a company called Netscape uh, back in mid '90s, and uh, by by the guy called Brendan Ike or Ike Ike. Yeah. Okay, Brendan Ike. So he created in 10 days, and I think he was hired to, uh, to embed Scheme into, uh, into Netscape Navigator. Uh, but Microsoft was competing with Netscape at the, po at the moment, and Microsoft, I think, they released Java in, in, in their Internet Explorer, and then uh, Netscape decided to counter-strike, counter so they told Ike to create something simpler. So he did. And that was how uh, uh, how originally it was called Mocha, and then renamed to LiveScript, and then renamed to JavaScript. So uh, and also in the same year, in 1995, Netscape released a server-side JavaScript, which it did not take off, but it did uh, with Node.js a few years later, as we know. So um, in 1997, Netscape a uh, uh, sent uh, the proposal for the standardization, so it was standardized as a, as a ECMA script, and uh, since that there were a couple of releases made. So third, uh, like third edition, which was first most uh, more or less stable popular uh, uh, standard in 1999, and then uh, 2009 was fifth edition. I think so far it's most popular, and uh, recently this year it was the sixth edition. So that's, that's JavaScript, I think that's nothing new for you. Um, and uh, there are tons of JavaScript engines. So j JavaScript engine is a, th is a thing, is a program that uh, uh, implements, uh, implements the language. So uh, in this table are just a few. So uh, maybe most, uh, uh, most known ones. So SpiderMonkey uh, is a, 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 it was uh, the original uh, engine in, in the Firefox, which was then replaced by Rhino, I think. Uh, V8 was created at Google, and it, it's, it's in the Chrome browser. And there are a bunch of others, so I didn't list them all. There are many, many, many of them. So and ours, which is called V7, is also here listed, the last one. So um, how JavaScript actually works? Uh, so the whole idea why people uh, use JavaScript. Uh, they provide scripting ability uh, to their uh, 
program. Whatever program they have, they want to give it a scripting ability. So uh, the program here is shown as the host program. It's at, at the very bottom. By the way, you can can you see all that? Can you see the slides? Well, okay. Um, then goes the JavaScript engine, which provides a two things: the standard library and the API to the host program. And then users can create JavaScript application, which is on top, that use both standard library and the uh, API of the host program. So this is an example of the browser. So when browser does it, it, um, it loads the web page with a bunch of JavaScript code. And a browser provides standard library and the mm, DOM API to the JavaScript uh, programs. And the way it works, if, uh, if the JavaScript code does some uh, call, it it's then gets translated through the JavaScript engine back down to the browser, which is shown by the, by the arrow on, on, on the right-hand side. So, um, and the browser takes an action. So the JavaScript is basically a way to uh, provide the guts of the host program to the external users. So external users can manipulate the state of the host program. So uh, in case of browser, uh, they can manipulate the state of the window that is shown. They can create controls and do whatever they want. So uh, say this is an example of Node.js environment. So in this case, you see that the, the difference with the browser is that pretty much everything stays the same, but the, uh, but the host program API is different. So instead of the DOM objects and the DOM, DOM specific uh, classes, uh, Node.js exports other set of objects like process, network, console, file system, and stuff like that. So uh, which browser does not export to, to the users. And uh, on top, you can see the example code. Like a, um, there, we, we, we just uh, read some file. So we read uh, etc hosts file from the file system and we, we, we log it. So, um, and this is an example of our um, embedded JavaScript engine. So the things that we export to the user is also a bit different. It's different from the Node.js, so it's different from the browser. We basically represent a small device. And small device is represented by a bunch of classes and, and, and objects. Uh, like file system, we have a small file system on device. We have a, a WebSocket HTTP interface, which is pretty much the API is taken from Node.js, so to keep it familiar to people. And we have uh, all sorts of hardware interfaces, like GPIO. GPIO stands for General Purpose Input Output. That's, that's, that's the hardware interface for uh, implemented by many micro microcontrollers. I2C is also uh, a, in uh, one of the hardware interfaces, and so on. So uh, as an example, uh, I, I show the code which sets uh, one of the GPIO pins to a uh, to certain level. So I, I'll, I'll show that la later on. So um, yeah, so uh, let me show that, and uh, maybe you'll, you, you'll, you'll, see what, you'll see what I'm showing to you, because the thing is very small. So first of all, before I, b before I show it, um, I'll explain what, what, a typical, what a typical IoT device is. So um, this is a typical IoT board. It's very popular these days. Uh, it's called ESP8266 created by a Chinese company called Espressive Systems. Um, and here you can see what are the uh, hardware parameters for that board. So it has 32-bit Tanzilica processor. It has about 50K of RAM available to the user. Um, the actual amount of, the r of RAM is a bit more than that, but after SDK is loaded, it's about 50K. And it has about a half mega of flash. So not much, as you can see, so not much at all. And uh, on the picture, uh, if, you, if you see the picture, um, the board itself, so the microcontroller, and are you familiar what microcontroller is? Uh, please raise your hands, who knows what microcontroller? Okay, cool, oh, cool, thank you. So microcontroller uh, is marked there as like small, a uh, small red box. 
it's it's really small. It's kind of like a half of your fingernail, and um, it has inside it has a, a embedded RAM that 90k roughly of RAM. It has a lot of peripherals. It has this processor, and also it has the Wi-Fi transceiver. So it has that Wi-Fi uh, radio built in inside the this small MCU, this small a, a black box. And uh, the Wi-Fi antenna that you can see is just an antenna. It just comes out of it. And the flash is an external, so uh, this MCU doesn't have a flash inside it. So, uh, and uh, the beautiful, uh, the beautiful fact about this board is that it is the price of it. So you can buy this board on Alibaba for two dollars, roughly. So it costs like yeah. Uh, and I know uh, from uh, uh, authoritative sources, uh, which is the CEO of the company who makes those chips, that the uh, production cost of one of such MCU is below 50 cents. So it's really, really cheap. So, um, but as you can see, the hardware capabilities are not, not really impressive in comparison to what, what, what we've used to. So, uh, which means that a majority of the JavaScript engine that we engines that we know, they cannot work on these boards, but ours can. So, uh, before before uh, jumping uh, to the uh, next uh, next things, I'll I, I'll show how it works. So, uh, this thing here that I have on the on the breadboard. Is the uh, is this uh, MCU that is shown in the picture? Uh, it's just uh, with the um, uh, with the built-in USB adapter, so you can you can plug it in, and it powers and as well provides the um, the serial interface, so you can have a terminal access to this uh, to the small board. So it's exactly the same board as shown on the uh, on the picture, and also I, I've connected the small LED. It's not actually small, it's a big LED uh, <laughs> here. Uh, so, um, and uh, I have a program uh, that we wrote ourselves uh, to flash uh, our firmware on, on these chips. Uh, on our side, there is a video that shows how can you, do you can download the, the, this uh, tool, the flasher, and the firmware itself, uh, and, and uh, burn to this chip and start start doing this, what, what, what I'll be showing to you in, in less than two minutes. So, uh, which is a really short time in comparison of what, usually what it usually takes to start embedded development. So uh, if, uh, if you guys, one of you decided to go and do embedded development, you'll, you'll, you'll feel the pain. Uh, but with, uh, with SmartGS, it's really simple. So just running this tool, connecting to the, uh, to the USB and, and pressing flash firmware, and that's it. So after after connecting to the uh, uh, to the uh, serial, you've got a a, a, f a prompt, uh, which looks like a bash prompt on on Unix, but it's a JavaScript prompt. And on this prompt, what it shows it shows the amount of the memory available. So it's about 30k of, of memory available, and that's the uh, amount of memory taken by the uh, by the uh, JavaScript environment. So um, and if I, uh, if I type this, which shows the global object, you can see what kind of stuff is exported. Um, so I'll show a couple of things that we provide, like for example, file interface has a file list function which shows the file system on this, uh, on this board. The file system here is really tiny, it's 48K. Uh, with just a few files, which are JavaScript drivers for all sorts of sensors, um, and um, um, and it doesn't have directories because it's small, uh, you know, no directories, it's just flat file system like an old CPM. If you remember that thing, uh, which DOS DOS is derived from CPM, it also had a flat file system. Um, so uh, another interface, as I mentioned, is GPIO, and this interface uh, it has like a couple of methods. Uh, they are all documented on our website. But for one of the methods is uh, the set mode, where you can set what the pin uh, number. Uh, so these boards have like pins, 
uh, and you can specify a, okay, put like a high or low voltage on that pin and uh, using, using, uh, using JavaScript. Um, so I'll do just that. So GPA, you're right. So pin number 14 and I'm setting zero means low voltage. LED is not, is not on, but if I set one, uh, it's high voltage, so it's on. So you can see, if you can see, can you see it? So yeah, it's on. So, and uh, we can do, we can let it blink. It's a very typical, it's like a hello world program in all other languages, an embedded program means blink. So whatever, when you start with uh, working with the new board on Arduino, whatever it is, it's blink example. So uh, let your LED blink. So let's do that with, with JavaScript. So uh, obviously we know the function, it's GPA or write, so it's either one or zero. So we should put a, a, a something like set interval, you know, with that function and, a, and alterating the level, uh, one or zero. But we don't have set interval, but we have set, set timeout. So let's do this. Uh, so we can say uh, level equals one and then a function f uh, and here in the function we can say uh, gpio dot uh, write uh, pin 14 and then uh, level and then level equals not level right and then we have to do set timeout this function and say um, a 200 milliseconds Okay, and call it. So, yeah, so now it blinks. Uh, and uh, so the beauty of it, it's a JavaScript. So it's very, it's, it's familiar with you guys uh, and it's, it's simple. It's, uh, honestly, JavaScript probably is not the best language for embedded development. Uh, so when we were thinking what script and language we should put on our uh, platform, we were thinking hard, but yeah, JavaScript was the only answer because uh, so many people know it. Pretty much a any developer knows it. It's on every browser, everybody knows it. So you don't need to teach JavaScript. So that, that drove the decision. So uh, that's why we started to write our own uh, JavaScript engine. So this is an example of, of, uh, uh, of LED blinking. Uh, another example that I want to show is uh, how to uh, uh, access web because uh, IoT is about internet connection and connectivity. So what's the point if it's not connected? Um, so I tried to connect to the local Wi-Fi but it, it didn't work. So I started a, 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 a hotspot on my, uh, on, my, uh, on my phone. So let's see if it works. So uh, there is a uh, it, there is an object called Wi-Fi with set of methods. Uh, so let's see what's the status of Wi-Fi connection. Okay, so it says got IP. Cool. So what's the IP? So this is the IP, and uh, we've got a, a, a Node.js like API. So it's a subset of Node.js HTTP API. So we have both client and server uh, support, uh, but not all the functions are implemented. But the most uh, you know, the basic functionality is there. So uh, that's an example of uh, HTTP uh, request. So if one HTTP request, so it has uh, two parameters. First parameter is the uh, uh, options object, where, uh, where to go. Say we go to google.com and a the second parameter is the callback. So the callback gets the response and here we just, let's just print the response. And uh, we just end. Oh, uh, syntax error. So what it, what it says, oh, google.com. So where, where is the error? Again? Still says the uh, okay, yeah, 
different, yeah. Cool, so, um, so you can see the response, so we just print everything, uh, all the response, so it has a, all stuff in it, like body, which is a redirect from Google, yeah, go to different address and uh, headers and everything. So, um, so this is it, uh, and that, that thing is still blinking. Uh, so this just shows that uh, it's possible to uh, program uh, such small things uh, in, in JavaScript using, uh, using our platform. So, uh, and it provides a more functionality, and we're working on more functionality. But uh, what I want to um, talk about a little bit uh, is about a few tricks uh, that we implemented to make it so small. So let me switch back to my uh, presentation. Uh, so here's the, a, a small comparison chart uh, for, uh, for, so I put, I put uh, in the middle you can see ESP, so that's ESP uh, uh, hardware uh, parameters. It has half meg flash and 50k of RAM. On the left hand side there is no JS. So on disk, on my Mac, uh, it takes 11, uh, uh, 11 megs of, of s uh, 11 mags. So it's not completely apples to apples comparison because uh, ESP, it uses 32 bit. So it's different architecture, different build, but it still gives you an idea. There is no way Node.js will fit into this thing. There's just no way. Um, and SmartJS parameters are, are on the right hand side. So uh, we've built it specifically for these small things. So uh, if you're looking, like if you uh, if you if you want performance, no, uh, we we don't do that. But if you want size, uh, yes, we can do this. And also, if you want simplicity, for example, if you have like a program and you want to provide some easy configuration interface to it or e easy user scripting interface, that's us. So we have like two design goals: a small footprint and uh, easy API. So the whole thing, the whole engine is just one file, uh, one C file. You can you just drop it into your project and use the API. And we specifically made API like un, un, you know understandable. So uh, in the in the platform we have two main components. First is the uh, Mongoose library. It's not that Mongoose that you used to know. Uh, the Mongoose that you used to know is the uh, MongoDB adapter. Uh, this Mongoose is another Mongoose, is the C, um, C library. Originally was embedded HTTP server, which I started to develop in 2004. So, and then these guys from uh, Mongo or Node.js community decided to name their project exactly as my project. Damn it. And uh, so now there is a clash. So sometimes people from MongoDB asking questions on Mongo's mailing list, hey, what do I do with this database schema? And we always route them to the <laughs> different mailing list. So um, uh, right now Mongo supports many protocols and uh, we have many, uh, many people using that. Uh, it's in Apple Maps. It's in uh, it's in space on International Space Station. It's uh, many other places. So uh, and the JavaScript engine V7, uh, as I told you, uh, we started development in 2013. So far, it's the smallest engine in the world, uh, at least uh, by our knowledge. We don't know uh, any other uh, engines that is that is, that is smaller. Uh, and we are looking at the competition closely. Um, so, and again, as I said, the design goals for uh, V7 is the simplicity, API simplicity, and the small footprint. So, and this is the uh, this is the uh, kind of more detailed architecture of uh, of SmartJS. So you can see that that uh, that layer uh, of the um, uh, the host program uh, we implement is basically we just name the interfaces that we implement hardware interfaces like SPI, GPIO, I2C, and the networking layer. So, um, what makes V7 small? First of all, is the careful data structure design. It's it's written in C, by the way, and uh, and a, a lot of tricks. So we we just we just it's it's full of full of tricks. 
So, and I, I'm gonna describe just two, and there are many more. Um, so, first trick is NAND packing. It's well known. It's not something that we are like extremely unique about that. And the second trick is coroutine-based parser, which is not very well known thing. So, first NAND packing. What is that? Can you see that? It's very like the font is quite small. So, uh, hopefully, you can see that. If you cannot, I, I'll just describe by. Uh, uh, by words. So what is NAND packing? So you, you know that JavaScript has many uh, different uh, uh, types. Uh, there are scalar types like a number or string or a boolean and null and so on. And, and, and there is an object type which is a collection of, uh, of things uh, uh, with, with, with attributes. And so um, the uh, the biggest the biggest type uh, like the longest is is uh, is a number because by standard uh, JavaScript number is oh there's a typo by the way uh, JavaScript nib number is a double is a 64 bit double and and the format of the double is is specified by by the standard so it has one sign bit two bits of exponent and the rest 52 bits of mantissa. Um, so and if you can see the picture, they uh, it's it's uh, it's it's uh, it's shown there. So sign bit with the letter uh, S, then exponent with the letter E, and the mantissa with letters uh, M. Um, so and the agreement, the the standard says that if exponent bits are all ones, and the mantissa in is not zero, uh, then the number is not a number. So it's not. It's not a number. And that fact we use to encode all types into one double type. That is called NAND packing. So the idea is that if the double is, n is not not a number, is a real double, then it's a real double. But if it's a, a NAND, which means if all exponent bits are one, uh, then it's not an N, it's something else, it's our type. So we use a, a mantissa, and mantissa, as you can see, is um, 54 bits, so it's more than six bytes. Uh, we use that six bytes to store uh, what number is that, uh, sorry, what type is that. So, uh, and the, uh, the format that we use we use four more bits uh, as the uh, as the marker of the type. So you can see the first uh, twelve bits are reserved by the standard, and then we have fifty four bit uh, fifty fifty two bits. So we use four bits as the indicator of the type, which gives us sixteen different possible types, and then the rest forty eight bits uh, for storage. Uh, and 48 bits is six bytes. So uh, in four bits, we store like type, and you can see the defines there below. Uh, for example, if, if the type byte is C, it means it's Boolean. So when we, we store Boolean there, and in, 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 uh, in, the, uh, in, Mantis, in Mantissa, we, we store either zero or one. That means it's true or false. If uh, the... Uh, uh, type is uh, five, uh, that means that the object that is stored in Mantissa is, is a function. Uh, or what is function is really a pointer. And why can we store pointers in, in, in 48 bits? So uh, we know that on 64 bit platforms, pointers are also 64 bits. So how can we store 64 bits uh, of a 64 bit pointers? in just 48 bits. Uh, and the answer is uh, there is a trick. So there is an agreement now which uh, everybody follows. Then on 64-bit platforms, pointers are never bigger than uh, 48 bits. That's just, j that's just a fact. And that's why we can store pointers in 48-bit Mantissa. So this trick is basically uh, is used by us to pack all the types that we have, like strings, regular expressions, 
uh, functions, objects, everything into one uh, double type, uh, which can either serve as number or all other types. So this is one trick. A another trick is the coroutine-based parser. Uh, so when uh, when we have a JavaScript expression, and, and, and the example expression is shown there, um, we first parse it, and then we execute it. So can anybody spot a problem with this expression specifically for embedded systems? So it's a valid expression. It's perfectly valid, um, and just one plus two plus three and so on. But what could be a potential problem with it? Uh, what? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, uh, almost true. Um, the problem with this is, yeah, the possible stack overflow. Uh, why is that? Uh, because the, uh, the parser that we use, uh, we don't use any uh, parser generator to create the parser. We, we wrote it uh, by hands. Uh, it's a it's recursive decent parser. We pro you're probably aware of what how recursive decent parser works. So uh, it follows the language grammar. So lang language grammar defines a, a, uh, defines the language, and the recursive decent parser it just basically mirrors the grammar. So on top uh, is your statement, and statement can be in like a bunch of expressions and so on. So basically, to parse an expression like this, a parser calls a top-level function, parse statement, which then looks at, okay, so what tokens do I get next, and calls parse variables or parse expression or parse whatever. So, and in result, we have like a big call chain. And the thing is that the brackets, uh, they always, uh, they have like a highest priority, and they start the parsing chain from the very top. It's like, Brackets means an expression. So uh, in the brackets, there is an expression. An expression is a very top-level function. Uh, and it starts the whole chain of the, uh, of the uh, um, parser function. And we know that on the embedded system, the stack is, uh, is very small, is very limited. Uh, so if the total uh, RAM on this, on this thing is 50K, so you can imagine how a stack is. By the way, there is no operating system here, so n nothing. Uh, it's like an old DOS. It's an, a small, like a switching environment and a, a timer interrupt and things like that. And like in DOS, you have a, your program heap and one stack for everything. Uh, the stack grows down and, and heap grows up. By the way, do, 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 do you guys know why, uh, why stack grows down? Okay, um, so yeah, any idea why stack grows down? We well, usually know that on most architectures, not not on all of them, a stack grows down. Okay, so the explanation why the stack grows down is very simple. So if there is a one contiguous chunk of memory, say if you have a process, right, one process, and a y sometimes programs want big continuous contiguous chunks of memory. So you have big contiguous chunk of virtual memory. For example, on 32-bit processor, you've got four gigabytes of virtual memory. Usually, kernel takes one gigabyte of the top, so you have like three gigs left, and you want to give all that virtual memory to, uh, to a process. And you have a heap, which is dynamic memory, and you have stack, which is used for function calls. They, these both areas can grow, and you don't know in advance how much they're gonna grow. So what's the best arrangement for these two growing pieces of memory is to put them on the very sides of the memory and let them grow towards each other. So whatever grows faster will meet uh, the, the other chunk. So that's why heap usually starts at the beginning of, uh, of a dynamic memory and stack starts from the very, very top. Usually kernel takes one gig and stack start, starts straight away after one gig, so at three gigs address and, and grows down. So that's why, uh, that's why stack grows down. Um, so in, uh, 
in our example, it's a, a I, I, I can show you. So this is, this is an example of the stack trace for this expression. So I just a, a run it under debugger uh, and put a breakpoint of the parsing number. So you can see there are like 50 frames uh, to just parse one, one number. Uh, and every function frame, it takes stack space. So with this a, a expression, you can easily overflow stack on small, on small boards. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's the problem uh, with the embedded systems. It's just not enough memory. So and what we did, so what you're gonna do, so what are the what are solutions for that? Solutions are either to use parser generators, not to write parser by hands, or to flatten the parser. Uh, instead of recursion, use flat parser, but then uh, the parser code would be ugly because you lose all the algorithmic clarity uh, because recursive descent is really, uh, really simple to understand. It's like parse expression calls parse number or whatever. It's really easy to understand. The flat parser wouldn't be like that. So we decided to go with core routines. Uh, and uh, so we implemented our parser with the core routine. So we, we, we put all our parser code in one giant big C function and implemented a kind of like a fake function calls within one, one big C function. We faking, we are faking uh, function calls and we are faking stack allocations. So we are faking how compilers actually work. Uh, and uh, we use coroutine trick. So what's coroutine? Uh, it's a function that has uh, multiple entry points. So you know that usual function, it has just one entry point and multiple exit points. So you have only one function entrance and you can return from many places. You can return the results from ma many places. Coroutine is a thing which has also many entry points. Not just many exit points, but many entry points. And this is an example, it's called in Lua, because JavaScript, yeah, also Lua has a native support for, for coroutines, just to demonstrate what it is. So uh, wh what we do here, we have like a simple loop. It can be used for generators. Uh, we have a simple loop, and you can see within a loop, what we do, we yield. So this special called yield, it's not a return, it's yield. It's, it's a return from the, uh, from the core routine, but the core routine saves the state. So next time you resume the core routine, it starts from the place when it returned before, right? So the, the next entrance into the core routine would not be at the beginning of the function, but will be inside the loop and it will return the next value. So you can see from the, uh, from the listing here is that the four subsequent calls of coroutine returns one, two, three. It's like a, a, with the, uh, it's a loop and the next call returns a minus one. So this is a coroutine uh, and what, what, what it gives you, it's basically that function, it stores a, a not a function, coroutine and stores the state that's the main difference with the usual function. So it, it, it remembers uh, what, what, what were the local variables before, uh, before the call. So uh, I, I, will, like, I wanted to describe this uh, in details uh, here, uh, the, the code, how we did that, but then I realized, no, like it's, it would be too much. So you can, you, can, you can go and read the code and that would be a very interesting uh, exercise for for the uh, sanity, because uh, it's 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 really uh, it's really hardcore. So um, so that would that would allow us to uh, to shrink the uh, the call stack for pretty much uh, three in reality, three function calls. Uh, the text here says file is really three, and uh, and uh, the the nesting. Uh, if you have like a really complex expression with many nesting levels, it doesn't increase the nesting of the uh, of the parser because it's just one single big function. So uh, so that trick we we are not aware. Uh, we don't know of any other uh, engines that do similar thing. So uh, so far we are the uh, the only ones that that do that. Uh, we have uh, so this that's basically the end of my uh, of the description of these simple tricks. We have many others like the garbage collector, 
it's a it's also uh, a, a very interesting piece of uh, of of, uh, of software and very interesting algorithm uh, what we use to to make a a, a a garbage collector so but I won't go and uh, I probably will do it like next time hopefully uh, so if you want to see the code all of all our code is open source uh, so you can go and grab and see and play play with it and the documentation is uh, link is there shared on the uh, developer section so this is it that's me contact me if you want any questions guys Yeah, um, I have a question. Um, so, what have you used it for? So, like, what sort of kind of hardware kind of? Oh, uh, right. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, right now, uh, we support several hardware platforms. Uh, we started with this uh, chip with ESP because it's crazy popular. It's just it's just insane because it costs two bucks and people just are uh, uh, just insane about it. Uh, just to, to compare the similar, uh, the, the other chip that we ported to is from Texas Instrument. It's called the CC3200. It's very popular too, but it costs about 20 bucks. So this thing is 10 times less. Uh, and we support, so we are working on the a, a ARM embed uh, support right now. It's a big line of chips. And also we of course support a, a so-called POSIX environment, which is uh, everything which is uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, like you can you can download and try it on your on your laptop. Say if you have Linux, Linux also has support for GPIO, for example. So you can you can get it uh, in binary and just play with it in a couple of minutes just to see what it does. Thanks. Um, what are the what's that board being used for the small one in comparison to boards that are bigger than it? Um, so we have a couple of customers that use that board. So one of our customers, uh, they have an existing solution. Uh, so what they do, they do uh, uh, car diagnostics equipment. It's a German company. They, they have a, like a dongle, which they uh, put into the uh, uh, OBD interface in, in the car. You know, like in the car under the dash, there is like a slot. A, it's like a video slot. It's called OBD. Uh, stands for something like data or like basically it's hardware interface for the car. So you have that, they have that, a, that dongle, they put it in and they have a, a diagnostics program uh, on, the, on the laptop and, and they have a Wi-Fi chip, this, uh, not this, they have another Wi-Fi chip on this dongle and the diagnostics program talks to this dongle saying, hey, run this command the reply comes and then run this command. So basically they, they, they ping the machine, they, they diagnose the machine this way. And the Wi-Fi chip that they currently use, it, it's about 25 bucks and they switch to ESP to reduce the cost by 20 bucks. For, for, every, for every dongle they want to reduce the cost by 20. Uh, there are other, uh, we work with um, other guys, it's a, a, a small American startup, they do they do a, a video peephole. So they, it's a small thing uh, with a camera and they attach it to the, uh, to the door. So when somebody knocks, it has an accelerator, uh, accelerometer. Accelerometer wakes up the device. So accelerometer finds out, so if somebody's shaking, somebody's knocking, it wakes up the device, it powers it on, it, it wakes up and starts to uh, make like a, image snapshots from who's, who's knocking and it, it sends you to your phone. So uh, basically with this thing, if somebody knocks at your door, you can have like a, an alarm on your phone whenever you are, you can see who's, you know, who's knocking. You, you can like, uh, I think they, they potentially want to unlock the door if they want and things like that. But right now they just upload the, uh, the images. So, and they also use, uh, they use ESP to, to do that. Um, so, th th yeah, the number of applications is, is, is just huge. Uh, the thing is that why we have this IoT thing uh, going on right now is because of the hardware costs dropped so much. It's just insane. It, it's, it's like just a couple of cent, a, a really powerful chips, 
people are seriously thinking and putting things into the uh, uh, bottle caps uh, and things like that. Um, so that's why I, I, I believe that in, in few years time that that's gonna be everything is gonna be stuffed with this small things. Uh, but in the problem is that uh, the development tools for these things are so uh, so bad, uh, like the uh, SDK created by uh, this Chinese company, the hardware is awesome, the hardware is really good, uh, the software is just terrible, it's like the worst thing I've ever seen, like uh, I can go on for hours about this, but it's really bad. Uh, so what we want to, to do is to give a, a, a familiar tool to everybody to, uh, to deal with those small devices. Uh, thanks for the talk. You said already that um, performance is not really the focus of this, and I understand that. But do you have any measurements of like how it compares to like environments like Node and stuff? Yeah, we have uh, we have a uh, we have a continuous integration, and we run a, a footprint comparison with. Uh, I think we'll run Asprino, duct tape, uh, MicroJS, and V8. Um, so I cannot answer right now uh, in terms like. It also depends on the test, like what, what exactly you're measuring, right? Uh, so we are not bad. We are perf performance wise, we even like ahead of few embedded engines. I think we are um, ahead of a uh, micro GS and duct, duct tape. Even if it's not the goal, we are pretty fast. Uh, but again, it depends on the test. And we are, I think we are calculating Fibonacci or something like something stupid. Uh, and obviously things like V8 is, it's, it's um, just in type compiled, so it's almost native performance, you cannot compete with that. Um, so again, uh, bottom line, uh, we are actually pretty good, although the performance is not the goal. Any other questions? Do you think you'll support um, the Raspberry Pi Zero when it comes out? Uh, yeah, because it, it runs Raspbian, it, it runs Bosix. Yeah, we will. We're gonna we're gonna support it out of the box because we support usual Raspberry. So Raspberry Zero is not not different. The thing is that it doesn't have any embedded connectivity, which is pretty bad. Yeah. Um, and I still don't know why it's just five bucks. I cannot understand that. It's. Uh, something going on, but maybe somebody sponsored the, uh, um, the project. Any others? No. Oh, yeah. Sergey to Sergey. Uh, you sh thank you very much for a nice speech, and uh, you talk, uh, <coughs> you showed us uh, how you could interact with this ESP yeah. Uh, through command line, yeah. uh, but it's possible to uh, write a program, let's say, in WebStorm or uh, some IDE uh, or <coughs> JavaScript editor, and then just upload JavaScript into the uh, chip. Uh, yeah, so yeah, this way, upload, so you can upload uh, any program to, yeah, you can do that. Uh, we are working on the kind of file syncing interface, because right now it sucks, this upload uh, thing, it's really, it's not really good. Uh, yeah, you can do that uh, easily. Also, we are, uh, we are thinking about making a proper ID for that, so you can uh, edit files straight here in this, uh, in this tool. Uh, Maybe plugin for the idea. Uh, so one guy suggested uh, to, do, uh, to do it this way. So we, we just start a, a, a web server on this thing with a RESTful API, and most of the, uh, most of the IDEs, they, have, uh, they can have plugins to talk to this thing. So we'll do that. So instead of making our own ID, we'll just create an API to plug in any ID. Okay, cool. All right, thanks very much, great talk. Thank you.